All right, well, I am Dr. John Caulfield. I practice in Littleton, Colorado, Epic Dentistry. We've been hearing a lot of Epic today, right? I loved it. I was like, Epic, 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 Epic Software. Um, I have my friend here, an Alice orthodontist, Dr. Randy James. I'm going to have him come up and introduce himself in a minute, but I was kind of going to start out first. Um, and again, my practice, we talk about airway, sleep, and TMJ, and, and the more I'm talking about it and listening to what we just heard, I'm more about airway, right? Because airway is where it's really at. Um, I did a lot of work with TMJ, and then I started realizing that really an airway is the most important thing we have. We breathe every minute of every day. If you're not breathing, you're not living. Uh, sleeping is a third of our life, eight hours a day. So if you're not breathing and sleeping, you're really not living <laughs> in any way, either physically not living or you're not living very well. So that's why I really focus on these things. And the reality is we don't really treat sleep, right? Like I don't do something to actually sleep itself. I do something to airway, to let someone breathe better, to let someone sleep better. So the nice thing is we don't have to feel like we're actually treating sleep. We're actually helping someone breathe better, have a better airway to breathe through. And guess what? You end up sleeping better when you can breathe. That's kind of how it works. So the airway and sleep and TMJ connection, this has been sort of my whole life, right? Like my entire dental practice. Proper breathing is nasal, it's unobstructed. We're breathing through our nose, it's parasympathetic and diaphragmatic. We're getting the diaphragm moving, we're letting the body know, hey, we're not in fight or flight, we're all right, and we'll sleep tonight, right? I, uh, everybody who knows me knows I like to drop these rhymes all the time, so. Um, very important to understand that, that how you breathe tells your body how you're doing. As soon as you mouth breathe, your body thinks it needs to do something. It needs skeletal activation. It needs sympathetic activation. So those snorers are sympathetic snorers, right? Parasympathetic is the diaphragm moving, the vagus nerve, the phrenic nerve. It's actually telling the body, rest, digest, let your body recuperate, let it heal. So, you know, so many times we talk about, and this is where we're gonna go with this, is anatomy and function are very important things, but they're very separate things. So proper jaw position and development is what's super critical for a wider forward and adequate airway volume, adequate joint space, and adequate tongue space. These are the things, when I look at a patient, I look at, do they have enough tongue space? Do they have a scallop tongue, right? Is their tongue trapped? They can't go anywhere except for backwards. And what's backwards? The airway. So a scallop tongue to me is a very big danger sign. Um, I look at their joint space. Do they have a vertical? Does their joint have room? Is it pushing against their ears? Right? You can feel, you can put your fingers in a, a patient's ears. You can feel their joint shoving your fingers out of their ears. And you wonder why tinnitus and Ear congestion and vertigo can happen with some of our TMJ patients. So jaw position, jaw joint space, airway space, tongue space. These are all things that are always on my mind when I look at my patients. And guess what? Sleep will get treated with that stuff, but I'm not looking at them going like, whoo, I gotta make you sleep better, right? And honestly, after that last presentation, I'm like, I don't wanna be in that work with any sort of insurance. I'm just gonna treat the airway and not have to deal with all that stuff. But joking aside, um, proper neck position, curvature, and rotation, that's why I brought this guy. You guys are gonna be amazed when you see some of our cases, what's happened between our patients with their airway structure because of their neck structure, right? We treat the front of the airway, but what about the back of the airway? And the back of the airway is the back and the sides of the airway. We're the front and the sides of the airway, so he and I literally meet in the middle. And that's where the fulcrum, right, the forces from the mandible is at C1, C2. And the middle of our is where the airway goes too. Really critical. And I think you guys are going to start to see how important these things go together. Um, proper tongue position and function. Jerry did a great job this morning. Thank you, my man. I really appreciate you. Um, really talked about how important our tongue is. How important growth and development and kids. Please, please, please start looking at kids. I know we are all like, oh my gosh, I've had a heck of a day. I can't chase a kid around my office. But if you can just get them in the chair for two seconds, 
even if you just have them look and yell at you so you can look and see if they've got tonsils in there or not, you're doing a service. If you can start to diagnose lip ties, tongue ties, look for that kid that's mouth breathing the whole time. Let the parent know mouth breathing is incorrect breathing. It's sick breathing. There's something wrong. Even if they want to get them to a pediatrician or an ENT or someone else, start looking for this because it is so important because that's what's going to create the adequate intraoral tongue space. It's got to be proper swallowing and myofunctional training to support any oral space we do gain, right? And also to make sure that our teeth are lined up properly. You know, we all think our teeth just kind of magically come in in the right place, but guess what? Muscles move bone, muscles move teeth. Tongue pushes up and out, cheeks and lips pull back and in. Where those two things balance is where your teeth end up. If the teeth aren't aligned, it's not because they were designed wrong or had the wrong GPS in them. Our bodies are incredible. They know exactly where every cell is supposed to go, but we have all these environmental things that are stopping the natural progression and growth. And thousands of times a day, kids are swallowing. Thousands of times a day, they have the opportunity to push their tongue up and resist that inward flow and inward muscle force. So we've got to start looking at the problem and figure out the real cause of the problem versus the symptoms and what are some solutions, right? So getting that and then the proper tooth position and the bite, the occlusion, right? We're all dentists or a lot of us are dentists. I'm glad, I'm so glad we have some medical doctors here too because this is all overlapping. But we are in charge of that bite. Who else other than a dentist should own this bite? We gotta know how to balance the bite, left and right, front and back. We have to know how to give it a proper guidance and proper support to the joint. We have to know anterior guidance, canine guidance, separation, taking away the posterior occlusion, the posterior neurology. As dentists, we are neurologists. Every time you change a tooth in the mouth, you just change the neurology in the brain and in the mouth. So it's very powerful stuff that we have to start looking at because we actually have a huge influence in joints and muscle and health. And so this is where all of this kind of comes together. As Jerry was showing this morning, all these kids that are suffering from all these tree symptoms up here. You know, if you look at a tree and you see unhealthy fruit, unhealthy leaves, like, yeah, you can go in and just cut off the unhealthy un fruit and leaves, but why not look at what's going into the soil? What do we need to do to help this tree respond and recover and get healthy again? Why is it not healthy? And so looking right here in the middle, this is all about the airway, compromised airway, and it's narrow dental arches, underdeveloped upper and lower jaws, and a crooked neck. Believe it or not, a neck that's not healthy, that's not being built right, that's not positioned correctly, there's inflammation around that neck, there's swelling, you start getting it closing in. Remember that concentric picture we looked at down the airway? Well, concentric means all the way around. We gotta look at the neck and the jaw and the bite and the, uh, um, the entire aspect of the airway. And again, going back to what we were talking about with Jerry, softer foods, the soft diet, the mouth breathing, the weak tongue, the underdeveloped tongue, the tied tongue. These are the kind of things that we can make a huge difference if we start down here and work our way up versus just throwing medications and treatments at all the top things, the fruit and the leaves, right? So this is how I'm looking at my patients now is, how do we change that? Because we know that 98% of patients who do have sleep apnea syndrome symptoms, 98% is some sort of a skeletal issue. It's a body issue. It's an anatomical, a form issue. So that we know if we do oral devices, if we're doing expansion, transpalatal growth, we're changing the airway by changing the form and the anatomy. And when we do that, that's when we get to change the function. So our goal is to restore the stages and the cycles of sleep because they're breathing through a bigger, better, proper, adequate airway. That's how I look at patients now. I'm not trying to treat their sleep. I'm just trying to treat their breathing. And guess what? They breathe two thirds of the day and they sleep a third of the day. So I'd rather have them breathing right the whole day and night. Get them all the time breathing right. And when we do that, we get the function here and then the form of nasal breathing, diaphragmatic movement, parasympathetic control, reduced airway collapse. We saw that earlier today. Way less collapse in the airway when we breathe through our nose versus through our mouths. 
So we're doing so many powerful things. If we just focus on a few things, it turns the big thing. And this is it. To me, this is what I'm starting to do with every patient is what's their form and then how do I increase the function? Because with better form comes better function. And then when you have better function, it actually brings back better form. And then that better form continues with better function. So we kind of follow the nutritious cycle of form and function versus the vicious cycle of deformity and dysfunction. So I'm starting to look at my patients and go, huh, we got to find a way to get better anatomical form and then we get our better function. And when that happens, you usually see we get this increase in the, in the root floor, uh, the mouth of the floor. We, we can actually expand the palate. We can grow and develop. I use my Vivos appliances to expand and create more tongue space, widen the maxilla and increase the volume of the nasal pharynx as well as the oropharynx. All different aspects of the airway because the top of the mouth is the bottom of the nose. So if we can increase and improve those things, and I've been talking to several doctors here and I'm super excited about it, that we're seeing how we're increasing nasal airway volume. And like we just showed you, if you're not breathing through your nose, you're not breathing right. So why not make that better? Let's not worry about just holding the jaw forward. Let's get people breathing the way a human is supposed to breathe. Mammals are obligate nose breathers. We gotta get back to the basics. And once we make more space for that tongue to perform and properly position and function itself, that's when the airway stays open. That's when the airway doesn't need a CPAP or an oral appliance because it has the room it needs and the muscles are trained to do what they've supposed to have done and have always done for years and years and years. And it's these kind of increases in growth in jaws that really makes a huge difference when we're playing the airway in the sleep game. Because yeah, we can pull the jaw forward, but then that changes the joint, that changes the muscles, that changes the body's reliance upon a, an appliance. Just like, I, I call it CPAP conditioning. Right? The body gets used to not having to do things, so it doesn't do them. And if appliance is always holding the airway open, muscles start to relax, they don't feel like they have to do that. It's like that negative feedback loop. We're not giving the body the right signal and the sign that it's supposed to do what it's supposed to do. We're kind of letting it be lazy and not do what it's supposed to do. But when you get this kind of growth, look at the change in the palate. Imagine what's happening up above in the nose. How much wider and broader and I did this to myself. I could feel the difference to breathe through my nose with unobstructed airway, with tons of nasal airway volume. I didn't realize my narrow palate meant I had a narrow nose and a very narrow nasal uh, passageway. And this is in nine months I treated a patient with my Vivo's upper appliance. Look at the difference in their maxilla transpalatal growth. And she, was, she kept saying, wow, I can breathe through my nose so much better. Well, no kidding, right? We just expanded you like five millimeters. We gave your tongue a better place to go. And if you look at before, this is where her tongue used to go, look at the after. And this one's six years later. Six years later, she still has this growth and development. She's got her tongue in the right place. She's breathing through her nose. And look at the size of her airway difference. Isn't that crazy? This is what we can do with growth and development and oral appliances that actually not only hold the jaw forward, but grow the jaw forward. This is why I love using my Vivos. It's one of my favorite tools. It's not my only tool, but it's one that if I can use it and if it's appropriate, it's great. It gives me the great feedback. But what I want you guys to look at, and this is my patient Christy, look at her neck in this picture versus that picture. Look at her posture change. Look at the, look at the tilt in her nose, downwards and backwards upwards and forwards. Look at how her neck corrected by correcting her jaw and her bite. And that's where this guy comes in. I started realizing my patients were having neck headaches and they were having TMJ headaches. I started seeing that my airway patients were having a totally different response when they got their neck right and the proper bite, which we saw today with Dr. With Dr. Gergen, right? He hit a, a great bite. I love the phonetic bite, actually. I think that was a great demonstration. It's something that we should all talk about. What are the bites to use? That's a great one. So I want you guys to uh, give me a, a warm welcome to my friend, Dr. Randy James. Thank you. 
I feel like it is an incredible privilege to be here talking to all of you people because everybody in the room right now that's not outside going to the bathroom, taking a pee, checking their email, calling their wife, calling their husband, if I don't blow your mind in the next 35 minutes, you will at the very least know a hell of a lot more than you did about the neck than when, you, when we start right now. So uh, congratulations for those coming back in. Uh, I hope I teach you something and give you content to think about that maybe you didn't even think about had to do with your airway. Uh, Randy James, you, this is a derivative of a class I teach. Some of these slides we're going to pass right over. Some of them we're going to stick around on for a minute. But I want you to visualize and see what I'm talking about because it's not just me standing here telling you that this stuff exists, it's me showing you. Is there an echo or is that just me? It might be this other mic. Okay, let me get away from that thing. You're good. Okay, so uh, USC undergraduate, Palmer College of Chiropractic graduate, postdoctorate or postgraduate training was at Sherman uh, in South Carolina, Sweat Institute, St. Petersburg, Florida. I did postdoctorate dissection uh, in Spartanburg. I, I did postdoctorate dissection in Marietta, Georgia. It would be safe to say that the neck is my thing. I've been married this September. I'll be with the same woman for 22 years. That's more than half my life. That's nice. insane. Uh, yeah. For, yeah, right? Thank you. It's, I, I think we both need a trophy. Uh, I do have a family. We have Muffin. Muffin is my daughter. Her name is Caden. They're both gymnasts. Uh, Connor, Big Bear, he's my uh, lifelong riding buddy. Um, so I do have a family. And I have Berkeley. And Berkeley is a great thing to start talking about because when I take Berkeley to the vet, what's the first thing the vet does? as he pulls his lips up and looks at his teeth because you can really figure out a lot about the health of an animal by looking in its mouth. When's the last time you went to your doctor and they even bothered looking in your mouth? They don't, right? Uh, so I th that's interesting. So this is our pup. Uh, there's no conflict uh, with me being here. I don't have a dog in the fight. I just want to show you what I know and what I've discovered. Um, I do want to explain the functional airspace and how it relates to the neck. I want to explain how the upper neck dictates the size of the functional airspace. Uh, and I want to tell you how it can be corrected at the same time. And then the dog and pony show here, which is me and John, are going to teach you how to incorporate it practically into your clinics so your difficult cases are easier and you have better outcomes. Because I can tell you all, when third-party payers and people figure out there's a more cost-effective way to actually treat the problem than treat symptoms, and you guys are already doing this, while everybody else is trying to put their shoes on to come to work, you're going to be drinking from the fire hose of people coming into your practice. So you're already, you're already on it. Everybody else is going to be playing catch-up. This stuff is good enough for my patients. If it's good enough for my daughter, I obviously b believe in it. Uh, so here's her... Uh, kind of follow up. Here's her airway uh, that has has grown. This is Big Bear. He's getting a tongue tie release. So, and you probably recognize the guy up there at the top doing the tongue tie release. So, uh, obviously, I'm drinking the Kool Aid because I believe in this. So, cranial cervical joint. That means the skull C1, C2. All of us in this room have a bowling ball that sits on top of a little itty-bitty neck. That bowling ball weighs about 14 pounds. In our neck, the typical cervical vertebra, which means C2 and lower, has facet joints. Facet joints are a locking mechanism. They're a bulkhead. They keep our spine from moving too far. They limit mobility because all the spinal column is, is it's a conduit for our spinal cord to live in. And the, the bones around it just protect that. So part of the locking mechanism, part of the protection is facet joints. People go in and get spinal injections and facet blocks. That's what they're talking about is facet, facet injections. Uh, so those lock the spine from moving too far. The atlas and axis are different. So our head sits on top of this bone right here. So C1 and C2 are held together by a bunch of tough ligaments that all blend together. But what we don't have up that high in the neck is facets, so we have lots of range of motion. So we can turn and see what's coming behind us. If we had facet joints, you'd have to move like this. You wouldn't have a whole lot of range of motion. So you can turn your head easily, see what's coming behind you. Uh, there's a lot of muscle that layers over that. In fact, we don't even think some of this muscle contracts. I'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> so you got a freely movable joint, nothing to protect it, held together by muscle and ligament. 
So it's, more, it's, it's susceptible to injury. You can hurt this thing. Now, not everybody's a, an ice skater, but not everybody's a dirt bike rider, but there's plenty of car wrecks. Anything where you get your head snapped around a few times, that can cause damage to the craniocervical joint. What happens? Well, people become painful at the base of the skull. They have headaches that stem from their neck. They go over the top of their head to above, below, or behind the eye. Their neck hurts. They have ringing in the ears. Uh, they have atypical facial pain that can get into any of the three divisions, V1, 2, or 3 of the, faci uh, of the facial trigeminal system. I won't go into this because it's too much. But what does happen is when the bone that holds the head up is tipped because those ligaments are damaged, your head's tipped. Your eyes have to be crooked with it. Well, guess what? We all want to see, our brain wants to see the world level, so we lean at the waist to compensate for that. So when you lean at the waist, it creates a whole body imbalance. You can make one leg shorter than the other, which is something we examine for, but also most people in this room should recognize if your head's tipped and you're leaning to one side, what's the jaw? It's a bone that hangs from your skull by muscle and ligament. It creates a malocclusion. Your jaw doesn't fit right when your head's crooked. So my neck problems complicate your dental problems. When our head tips from, to one side or another because there was damage or an injury there, something happens lower in the neck. This is biomechanics, this is simple biomechanics. We have something called coupled motion. When my head tips, the, bone, when my head tips, the bones below it have to rotate. Lower cervical joint rotation is a biomechanical feature of head tilt. What I want everybody to do, if you will bear with me, reach up, feel right at the base of your skull, right at your hairline, right in the middle, and go down maybe two finger lengths and you'll all feel this massive lump right there. Sometimes it probably hurts at the end of the day. Can you guys feel the, the bump? That's the spinous process of C2. So with big movements, tip your head to one side and then the other. Do you feel that bone flipping around and flopping in there? Okay. Now tilt your head just a little bit, like just millimeters, a tiny bit. Do you feel how much it really moves? So a little hinge swings a big door at the base of the skull. So if your head tips, the lower neck has to rotate with it. And this is going to be important just a little bit, in just a minute. The same thing's happening with rotation in your lower neck. You just can't feel it because there's too much muscle. It's hard to palpate. This is a big discussion, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna wrap it up for you quickly. There is a ton of biologic investment in us being upright creatures with our head on straight. They went and me measured how many muscle spindles, everybody knows muscle spindles and proprioception, our bodies know where they are in position. I know I'm standing here with my hand behind me, not because I see that, but because I'm coordinated. That's because of muscle spindles and fibers embedded within muscle that tells my brain where I'm at. Well, guess what? In prime movers like a bicep or a quadricep, I think there's like 40 muscle, gram, muscle spindles per gram. In the masseter, 624. So you better believe the jaw knows where it's at in position because I can talk, I can chew gum, I don't break teeth when I chew my steak at night. These are the muscles that I talked about at the beginning that I kind of glazed over. Um, a ton of muscle spindles per gram of fiber here or per gram of muscle tissue. So we think these are actually sensory organs that hold the muscle at the base of our skull. It isn't necessarily contractile. It's just a receptor organ that tells our body where our head's at. We don't have to go into this. This I do want to go into. Anybody that's in, in, in practice, a provider that wants to know, how do I detect this, what makes me suspect this? Trauma, headaches, neck pain, my head feels too heavy for my neck. I feel like a bobblehead. You can poke somebody in the back of the head right where you just felt and push around in there. And if somebody says, ow, that hurts, I have headaches from there constantly, it's 99% likely that they have a problem in their upper neck. Okay, these are cases. These are ones that I'm working on currently or have worked on recently. Bear in mind, this is all geared up to teach dental providers how to recognize craniocervical injuries and defects on a cone beam CT.
we're not trying to do that today. But what I do want to show you is how the neck affects the shape or the contour of the functional airspace. So can anybody in the room tell me what view this is on a cone beam? Is this frontal, sagittal, or axial? We all say axial. That's right. It is an axial view. What's that? The, 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 see, you guys are awake. Thank you. I thought I saw heads dropping. Yes, you're awake. Okay, airway. That, that's the airway. Thank you. Can anybody guess what this is? It's a vertebra. It's a neck bone, right? So the posterior third of your airway here, this is all your world up here. Back here, look. This airway is dictated by the position of these bones. I want to keep going. These are views that I take in my practice. Uh, I will talk, to that, talk about that here in a second. So here's the atlas. This is C1, an axial view. You're looking down the top from a top view of this patient. This shows rotation of the atlas. It's a rotational misalignment. Look how close this bone and the soft tissue just anterior to it is to your airway. It's right there. Where's my localizer? I'm going through C2 right here. So this is the C2 cervical vertebra. There's your airway. Look how C2 is rotated. Why is it rotated? Because this person's head is on crooked. You tip your head, the bones below it. You just felt it in all your necks. They rotate. This person's head is on crooked. They have a defect in their upper neck. It's making their lower neck rotate. The lower neck is rotating into the soft tissue, changing the contour of the functional airspace, which you guys are all worried about. Here's another one. Now we're down to C3. Here's C3 affecting the contour of that airspace. Again, views that I take in my office to calibrate my equipment. Here's Janae, head pain, working mm -hmm. with the dentist, teaching the dentist how to read their cone beam to recognize increased periodontoid space. Again, axial view. Here's rotation of the atlas. It's proximity to the airway. And this is one of the questions when patients come to see me, I ask them, tell me about your headaches. Where do you get headaches? When do you get headaches? And anytime a patient goes, oh, I get it right here, and it comes over the top, I mean, they'll say it. If you start asking these questions, you'll realize you have a whole like, group of these patients that are in your practice. And they'll be like, oh, yeah, it comes over my head, over the top, comes to my eyes or my ears. That's when I go, you know what? You got to see my friend, Dr. Randy James, right? And I take a lot of cone beams because I do look at airway, and as soon as I look at the airway, again, he's trained me to go through like he's showing you guys to look at these rotations, look at these angles, look at how you can sometimes only see one facet in the slice versus another because there's a tilt in a, in a rotation. So these are the kind of questions we start asking, you start learning really quickly like, I need another person to help me with the back side of the airway so I can then work on the front. Well, and if my head's tipped, my eyes are crooked, and I'm leaning to one side, I've changed the shape of the airway because I'm leaning to one side. Mm -hmm. Do you want to build a device, put it in somebody's mouth with their head crooked? Wouldn't it be easier if you put their head on straight and then built a device and fix their occlusion to that? Hell yeah. Yeah, shake your heads. Yes. Yes. It is true. It is true. And it's okay because humans, patients, we're treating patients, right? They're people. They're people we care about. We're not treating panels of insurance and codes and all that. That's, I'm just so glad it's not just me that goes through that. So I feel better now. Thank you for letting me. <laughs> he's the only but, one right. that feels better, but he's good. Um, but patients have fleas and ticks. It's OK for them to have two separate problems. It's up to you, the doctor, to recognize that there's a comorbidity here that can be treated and fixed. Mm -hmm. And it'll make your outcomes better. Because when you're the best at what you do, nobody asks, oh, who should I see? Who's in my insurance panel? They just say, I go to them because they're the best, and I don't care what it costs. OK, more views. People's heads on crooked. Lauren, I remember her being really, OK, here oh, yeah. we go. I hate standing on a, on a podium. Go down. I like to come down. Get in there. there. There ain't nobody in this room that can tell me that they can't see that is the axial view of an atlas bone that holds everybody. We're all built pretty much the same. That's the airway. How can you tell me that that doesn't affect the airway? Darn straight it does. 
Look at the localizer. Now I'm through C2. That's rotated. That's the one you guys were palpating when you were tipping your head from side to side. That affects the shape of the airspace. That affects the shape of the functional airspace. I mean, I just keep going on. I, I don't even want to bore you with all this. I think I proved my point. Here's some noteworthy. Look at this person. I can't. They're breathing through a straw from the bar downstairs. That's tiny. This person is sick. That's what this person's breathing through. I don't even. I mean, yeah. I'm not the dentist. I'm no. not an airway dentist. But I can't. I got to tell. That can't be right. And look at that facet. Look at the look at the yeah. Look at the atlas. You can only see one side of the atlas because you're looking at a thin slice of them from the top. Their head's so crooked. Only one side of the bones even in the field of view on this cone beam. I mean, okay. Let's <laughs> move on. Here, this is. A, come on. You, nobody can argue with that. As you see it with your own two eyes. So at any rate, the, I'm proving my point. Neck dysfunction affects the shape and the size of the functional airspace. Might not be in every patient, but anybody that's looking at cone beams and sees something like this might want to give some thought to sending this patient to someone who can help correct that. Can I, I can't see it. Can anybody tell me what is noteworthy about this? Right in here. Does anybody see something right here? That's a calcified stylohyoid ligament. That's eagle claw syndrome. So the, the styloid at the base of the skull that attaches to the hyoid bone calcifies. And guess what? You see them a lot on cone beams. Here they are in the axial view. These things come down massively. I, I almost missed them on my x-ray, but there's a shadow of them right there. This person has been working on these for a while. Here's the 3D rendering. So that's bone embedded in soft tissue that's not supposed to be there. And right there, right between the back of that calcified stylohyoid ligament, but just in front of the atlas, is something called the jugular foramen. Guess what comes out of the jugular foramen, besides the jugular vein? Glossopharyngeal vagus. I mean, this is way back for most of us. I'll admit, I even looked on Google to remind myself. They're both mixed motor nerves, especially glossopharyngeal. It, it innervates the palate. I don't know. This is just the emerging things that are coming up that we're thinking about now with this upper neck, the anatomy involved. Could there be nerve root irritation that it lets the soft palate fall down? Sure. I'm just putting it out there because you guys are the thinkers. You guys are the ones that are here in this emerging thought process. I'm just putting this on your plate and letting you chew on it for a second. Pun intended. <laughs> Any questions? Back here. Yes, sir. Yeah, or come up. I was, I was looking at that. Um, I don't know. I, well, we're kind of through the combi. Look, we only got 15 more minutes left. I, I, you should, I wish you would have said something. No, it's a great thought. It's a great thought. Thank you. I, I wish I would have thought of that. I'm going to tell you, the, the airway gets smaller the more the neck rotates. Yes, just sir. Just a quick question. Yes, sir. Because you said, do you have any questions? And I've got sure. the doctor and the, and the chiropractor, and you haven't mentioned the quadrant theorem of Gouzet and where the middle of rotation for the jaw is. Say again. I'm sorry. I actually said C1, C2. I was talking about that. Okay. You, yep, I mentioned the, it. Okay, so the quadrant theorem of Gouzet basically was figured out by a mechanical engineer, and when you take in both translation and rotation of the mandible, the middle of rotation of the jaw is on the dens of C2. C2, yeah. Right. Um, so when we look at forward head posture, 100% of the time we're looking at abnormal function at both C1, C2, and the jaw joint. Yeah, exactly. Them. And that's either the, they're all right or they're all wrong. That's right. It's the form and the function. Well, and I Thank think you, Dr. Ira. you make a great point. And I think that that's, it kind of leads into the next thing, which I don't want to sit here and sell myself. But if you're going to 
treat your patient, you're going to send them out to have something done about it. You sure don't want to send them somewhere where they're going to get hurt. You don't want any egg in your face. And so that's what I do for a living as I treat the upper neck. Because you are trained, it doesn't matter if you're a medical doctor, I'll get to you in one second, you're an osteopath, you're a chiropractor, you're a PT, anybody that manipulates the neck, they flat tell you in school, do not manipulate the upper neck. There is a vertebral artery that goes through the little holes in the side of the atlas. And if you wrench on somebody's neck too hard, you tear the intimal layer of that artery. It can kick blood clots. They get in the circle of Willis, and you'll stroke a person out. This happened in North Carolina a week ago. Did anyone see it in the news? I thought it was Atlanta. No, it, it was in North Carolina. Well, you're right. There okay. was the one in Atlanta that he went to North Carolina because he had place, he lived in North Carolina, I think, and went to Atlanta. OK, OK. So people, oh, you go to a chiropractor, they'll kill you. Well, it ain't a lie. <laughs> it doesn't happen all the time. <laughs> But if you're going to be the one saying, hey, I think you have a neck problem, and I'd like you to go get this corrected, I want you to send you for this, you, I suppose there'd be some vicarious liability, so you better watch who you're referring to. And so I, want you, I, I just want you to know that there is a way to correct this upper neck without popping and wrenching on somebody's neck, where you don't have to go three times a week for the rest of your life, and you've got to prepay $9 million and all this stuff. There's just a very credible way to correct the upper neck there's a couple varieties. I happen to be of the atlas orthogonal variety. I'm biased because that's what I do, but there's NUCA doctors that do good work. There's Blair doctors that do good. I mean, there is a whole area of, of chiropractors. There are upper cervical chiropractors that do good work. I happen to do the variety of atlas orthogonal. Those images that I quickly scanned through and said, oh, I do these at work. I come up with these angles. Well, these angles that I calculate from, from imaging I do get plugged into this little device. Um, this is attached to a gantry that has angles of measurement and degrees here, which fixes rotation. We talked about rotation. And then this fixes laterality. So I can fix two parts of the, of the issue at the same time. I didn't make this in my garage. Somebody else came up with this. It was made in Georgia Tech. It, it emits a sound wave that's the equivalent of three and a half pounds of pressure. Hardly feels like it does anything, but like I said, Little hinges swing big doors. Goes right behind the ear because anatomically that's where the atlas is at. When we apply this correction, we expect when we push at the base of their skull that's no longer tender. They say that feels better. This, if I've made a correction to somebody's neck and I put their head on straight, when they sit up, their center of gravity goes back to the middle. Their leg length changes, but more importantly for you, when I have taken a head that's over here and a jaw that's over here and I put it in the middle, now their teeth hit differently. So this is why if John has a case that he knows is going to be a problem and he wants to start with me yep. to make a better outcome, they go to me, I treat, and they go directly to his office without any meals, no gum chewing, no talking, try to get over there before you bite down on something. And this is critical because one of my rhymes that I'll just drop on you guys right now is that I don't take a bite if the neck is not right. And I'm dead serious. Because guess what? I've done it. Patients are like, I don't want to see a neck doctor too. Just, just do my case, right? Well, now I start doing their case. They're not getting better. I'm like, look, I really think you need a neck correction. I've put all this time into making a perfect orthotic. I had the bite dialed in. They go over to him, he makes one adjustment, they come back, and all of a sudden they're only hitting on the right side. And I now have to like totally redo my entire orthotic to then land these dots again back where they were supposed to be. So what I've learned is his corrections make big swings and then I can do all the little things, right? I can just then do fine details, but it is a huge difference maker. And I'll be honest with you guys, I have sent patients to Randy that had, came and saw me for headaches and migraines and TMJ problems. As soon as he got their neck on right and their head on straight, all their headaches and migraines are gone. And guess what? I still got those patients back for cleanings, you know? <laughs> but the reality was I did the right thing. Those patients have referred other patients to me and said, hey, go see this guy. He got me, got my neck corrected. So. You know, we got to start working with our, our, our team members, right, and our, our different uh, doctors that can help us because sometimes we think we're treating the big problem when really the bigger problem is behind where we're working. And if we get that fixed, everything else is easier. Patients come in, they're not in pain anymore. 
He's called the Headache and Spine Center for a reason. And like I said, I know which headaches are caused from the mouth, from the TMJ, the master, the temporalis, lateral medial pterygoids. I know which ones are going to cause what they're going to look like. And I also know now, l luckily through his teaching and, and working with me, which kind of headaches he can help with more. And so my goal is always, let's eliminate as much as we can from the get-go and then go from there. Dr. Jerry. Yeah, we've talked about aquilizers, cotton rolls. Yep, or if he was just at my office, right? Problem is, his thing's huge and heavy. Like, we got, he can't move it. So yeah, we can't been, take my show on the road. It'd be yeah, kind of hard. Yeah, his instrument's pretty big. But, you know, it ain't over yet. I mean, it'd be nice. Jerry was just saying that, like, after you get that adjustment, if they have, like, dysfunctional swallows, if they have, you know, tongue issues, they can actually start to already move things and change before they even get to my office. And so that's why I said, like, ideally, yeah, we'd be in the same building working together in the same room, but we've got it now where, like I said, we've, we've got a couple patients use, like, cotton rolls between their teeth so they don't bite on anything. Many times my patients already have an orthotic or a device, so then we do the adjustment with that in their mouth and then they keep it in their mouth. And he actually, the nice thing is he's teaching me about the neck. I now make him check their bite. Yes, I do. Yes, yes. yes right? I'm like, hey, tell me how the bite is afterwards instead. So yeah, it trips the patient out too because I tell him, I'll say, check your bite, see where you're hitting. Can you just get it in your mind's eye? Now lay down, do my thing, and sit up before I even touch. Him, check your bite. I hit on my right side only now. I'm like, well, John's got work to do, so go over yeah. there. So it's pretty cool, right? You know, I know we're close when they lay down. I adjust them. They get up, and they say, yeah, it's about the same. I know my correction's holding. I know his jaw is holding. And we get great outcomes. Yeah. McKittrick, she moved, we talked about this. Yeah. And she was one that came from me because this is a two way street. It's the other side of the same coin because I've got cases. I, I'm like, I can't get you to hold. I've re imaged you. I don't know what's wrong with you. I don't know why you won't hold. I don't know if you have a connective tissue disorder. There's something else going on here. Um, oh, yeah, by the way, my jaw pops every time I eat. And you didn't tell me this before. So I'll send him to John, he gets the jaw right now, all of a sudden my neck starts holding. So it goes both ways. So some of his easiest cases are some of my most difficult. And some of your most difficult. Exactly. Yep. So it works good for me because that's, what I, that's how I'm earning my keep with my patients. You know, I have to answer to them. I have to, I have to keep my spot on their team, right? So it's about outcomes, it's about happy patients. Because that's ultimately what we're treating is patients, and when they're happy, everybody's happy. That's as good a metric as anything, right? It's the only metric okay. that matters. Right? Okay, we got five more minutes. I don't want to keep running over. Keep and, going. But here, let me, let me do this. Yeah, this is pretty good. So, since I don't live in every town, I have two practices, and I can barely be at those two, um, I know everybody that's good. I've been doing this. This is. 20 years. I mean, I still have things to learn. School's never out for the pro, but I do know most people that do my type of work. Um, you can check it out for yourself at this, this website. This is all of the credentialed Atlas Orthogonal providers that have, that are up on their credits. That's not, there are people out there that are certainly credible that aren't on this list, but that's a good place to start. Or if you just put Atlas Orthogonal in your town in and see who pops up. If you can't find anybody, like I said, Nuke is a good, um, a good method, and so is Blair. Orthospinology is good, but you're not going to remember all this stuff. All you got to do, that comes right to me, or you can call the office. I'm happy, and I get nothing out of it. I just, know, I just like to know that I'm putting a professional with another credible professional that I, can, that I, that I either already know or I can help you vet out. So I've kind of turned into this liaison of between the dental community and my own community. And you might say, oh, there's two options. I might say, hey, that guy sucks and she's awesome. I'll just tell you. I, or or I, I like them better and here's why. I'm not, you know, I, I'll just, I don't know. It's not really my job. I just like doing it. So you can use me as a resource. And like I said, I am, truly, I feel like this is a privilege to be in front of all you professionals. You're way out ahead of the curve on this. Um, and I'm grateful to have been here. And we didn't run over. No. Let's take a couple questions. Somebody's got to have a question for me. Any yes. question? Yes. What's your typical protocol? Uh, so the microphone. Someone comes in, they've got. 
Yeah, there is a microphone in the middle if you guys want to come up here. Well, the and ask question questions. is, what's the typical protocol? Like, like, what's the expectation for the average patient? What, what should they? Okay, so I'll see an adult patient twice a week for two weeks, once a week for two weeks. By the time I'm into the third or fourth week of care, their chief complaint, that's going to be our metric for success, which is typically head pain. I should have at least captured 50% of that. I never pretend or promise anybody, oh, I'm gonna make all your problems go away, you'll be better looking, you'll have more money. But I should have earned my spot on their team inside of three weeks. If they've never treated with, with the dentist, they should be ready to start their dental care two to three weeks in. And when I say start their dental care, that means take bite, get impressions, because now you're taking a bite to the neck that's been straightened out. So you don't have to jerk around with all these little micro corrections to your bite later on, because their head was already corrected. Yeah. I'm not the dentist. I'm just, that's what it is. And what I'll tell you guys too, what's amazing is that, you know, patients will come to me and yeah, I see all the dental problems, but I'll just say to them, look, I want you to go see Dr. James first. I want you to get that correction, see how much benefit and relief you get. And he tells me all the time and my team tells me all the time that people are always like, you know, Dr. Caulfield's great. He doesn't just want to make money. He's not just in this to like treat. He's actually sending me to someone else first before he treats to see if that's gonna help more, right? And that actually is a dentist, when we actually refer someone to a, a doctor that can help them in a way that we might be able to help, but I know they're gonna get better help from him on certain headaches, that actually builds more trust than me saying, I'm the best dentist in the world, I'm gonna take care of you, right? So the cool thing is, we end up getting a better relationship because when, people, he, when he sends people to me, they know Okay, this guy's not just in it for the neck, and if he, he just gives up, if it doesn't work, he knows there's other options. So this is the kind of relationship that's made it just fun to practice together. Like we get barbecue about once every month or two. Not enough. You're not enough, right? <laughs> but uh, barbecues is next for you. Barbecues. Um, yeah. But uh, what's great is we sit and go through our x-rays together. He comes over to my office, he downloads certain patients. He, we, we go through, he teaches me more about their case, I teach him about their case. We're learning together and our patients are getting better. Right.